Hello, everyone. Welcome, Welcome to another episode of the Historian's Lounge. <clears throat> this is episode four of the Historian's Lounge, and I am excited to present our next historian with us. Joining me today is professor, author, historian, and teacher, Neil P. Chatelaine. Neil P. Chatelaine teaches history at Lone Star College, North Harris, and Carol Wunshi Sear High School in Spring, Texas. The former U.S. Navy Surface Warfare Officer graduated from the University of New Orleans, the University of Houston, and the University of Louisiana Monroe. Neil researches U.S. naval history with a focus on the U.S. Civil War. A member of the emerging Civil War, he authored Defending the Trace of Rebellion, Confederate Naval Operations in the Mississippi River Valley, 1861 to 1865, which was published in 2020, and Fought Like Devils, a Confederate Donald McRae, 2014. He lives with his uh, wife in Humboldt, Texas, and on what website do you learn more information? Joining us today to present his findings, as well as today's topic, post-war identity of the Civil War, Neil P. Chatelain. Neil, thank you so much for joining. Yeah, it's great to be here, Gabriel. Uh, looking forward to talking a little bit and getting some information out there for other folks to see. Um, so like you said, my topic is um, uh, the post-war identity crisis of the Confederate Navy's officer corps. And uh, it examines how Confederate Naval officers struggled post-war to uh, move on with their lives and to address the fact that they lost the war. And so there's a lot of different avenues of that that we'll look at today. Awesome, awesome. And as a special treat for you uh, listeners and viewers, we will actually be showing you, or rather Neil will be presenting his research and findings via PowerPoint so you can see this very interesting and often not talked about part of the Civil War. So Neil, all to you. Sounds good. Uh, let's go ahead and get started then, I suppose. Uh, can you see my screen there? You should be able to see it now. Yes. Ooh, okay. very nice. Very, very nice. So like I said, um, this is going to examine um, Confederate naval officers and how they struggled post-war. So a lot of research has been done recently on uh, what a lot of historians call the long civil war, which is kind of combining um, elements of the U.S. Civil War and the Reconstruction process into one large conflict that was part military and part not. And um, research has been done on how veterans tried post-war to move on and, and the struggles they faced. Um, some research has been done on like the U.S. Army. A lot of research has been done on uh, Confederate high leadership moving abroad after the war. And uh, this allows us, uh, by looking at the lens of the Confederate Navy, it allows us the lens of looking at things through um, smaller numbers, so more examples, smaller numbers, and more refined specifics through that lens a little bit. Nice, very nice. 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 Uh, so here's the premise of it all, and um, baseline is that the Confederate Naval Officer Corps struggled after the Civil War to figure out what to do with their lives. Um, they could not remain in the U.S. Navy because they had lost the Civil War. There was no Confederate Navy to stay in. And the Confederacy, the southern states that had seceded, uh, their merchant marine, their civilian maritime industry just was not as produced. And then at the end of the Civil War, there really wasn't much of it left at all. Uh, so there was that struggle of these officers had spent most of their lives in the naval service at sea and now... Their skill set is useless. They have no way to output that. And so uh, what we're going to see is that they've pushed through multiple different avenues to try to address this issue. And um, the, the numbers are kind of surprising. So the Confederate Navy is very small, but a large mm -hmm. percentage of those officers were involved in this identity struggle to try to figure out what to do post-war. Um, and the numbers are there, 33 percent of commissioned line officers and 10 percent of the lower ranking warrant and staff officers. So we'll 
divide that and look at it kind of individually as well. Fascinating. That's actually interesting. And I imagine, um, as I think a lot of people who have studied the Civil War, um, initially the Confederacy actually hired a lot of foreign uh, army trainers and army advisors to help with the Confederacy. So in your research, did you notice that there, if there was any um, foreign um, naval officers that were brought over to help train the Confederate Navy, or that kind of became the reverse with the Confederates becoming the foreigners for the Europeans? Yeah, yeah so most Confederate naval officers were um, prior members of the United States Navy, and I've got some statistics that we can look at um, as we go through, but um, by and large, everyone who was a, an, a senior officer in the Confederate Navy received training from the United States Navy. And um, as you mentioned, the reverse is actually true. And a lot of Confederate naval officers are going to go abroad after the war to um, join foreign military and naval services. And so uh, that expertise that they've learned in the U.S. Navy and during the Civil War is going to push outward into other elements in Latin America and Europe and so on. Wow. Interesting. Well, Ooh, all right. So, like I said, the Confederate Navy is small. There's only 794 officers in the Confederate Navy. At its wow. Um, so it's a very small group when you're talking about 3 million personnel on both sides involved in the Civil War. At its height, the Confederate Navy was only about 5,000 people strong. Uh, so a very small group. Now, of those 794 um, that were your completed military then naval service during the war 118 of them fit this category of not sure what to do post-war could not move on and they outputted that through multiple different avenues and uh, this chart just kind of provides an overview of all that with um it broken down by rank so um the higher the rank the confederate naval officers were the more likely they were to uh struggle in the post-war environment and then the lower the rank and the younger in age um, the more likely they were to remain in the South after the war and to uh, find avenues within the reconstruction of the Southern states to uh, address the fact that they lost the war, probably because they were younger and had right. more opportunities and skill sets than they weren't ingrained in 20 or 30 years of naval service by that point. Um, so some basics here is just... Um, a, this is an overall number of all Confederate naval officers and as you can see, the higher the rank, the more likely those officers were to be involved in this crisis of identity, as I call it. So if you were an admiral or a captain in the Confederate Navy, uh, it's about 42, 43 percent of them were involved in some sort of post-war activity, rejecting reconstruction or refusing to stay in the South. Um, commanders and lieutenants, it's around one third. And then as you see, uh, the lower ranks uh, mm -hmm. Warrant officers and then staff officers, doctors and supply officers and so on. And then members of the Confederate Marine Corps, it's more around 10 percent that were involved in this. Wow. And how long did it take to gather um, this research? Because I would imagine for this kind of topic, you would have to go through like a lot of different avenues from like first person accounts, uh, war reports, prisoners of war statements. I mean... How long did it take you to uh, statistically find all this information? Yeah, so as I went through, um, we're lucky that the Confederate Navy is small because you can identify every single person, every single person who was an officer in the organization, essentially. Um, the downside of that is you have the name of every single person, which means that the smaller the group, you can actually take the time to research every single person. Um, right. And now not every person in the Confederate Navy has records available that are there to see. Um, and we're going to see some of that statistics later on as we look at like post-war employment and so on. But, uh, you know, I started by looking at every single person, what their relative ranks were, uh, tried to find if they had written anything post-war, tried to find if they had records in the amnesty files of the National Archives, anything that would show what their post-war service was or what their what their life was after the war. So, uh, you know, I've literally Googled every single person's name to see if their name comes up in newspaper archives post-war um, for where they would live or burial records, anything like that. So it was definitely a drawn out uh, process, a lot of just mindless searching over the over long hours.
That's crazy. And I see, like, on your graph you show, like, the warrant off the warrant line officer is not involved in identity crisis. I mean, that's 280. That's that's a lot. Next to the staff officers, which is 228. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to show later. Um, mm -hmm. What was probably the most surprising um, piece of evidence that you found in terms of, like, the numbers for the different ranks? Uh, so, as you can see with the numbers there, warrant officers and staff officers, hundreds of people were classified as not involved in this. And I would imagine that number to be low in that um, only so many records oh, were found okay. for those officers. And so if I couldn't find evidence, I classified them as not. But over time, you know, more people, more records get uncovered. So I would imagine the numbers of those officers to go up as involved in this. Um, just as more records become available or I find them. So it is still an ongoing, it will always be an ongoing process as more people are identified. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind is, you know, it's a process, it keeps going. Nice, fascinating. And I'm sure there's probably like a lot more you uncovered too. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of records. Um, and uh, what I've done is in the article I wrote, that has the same name, Post-War Identity Crisis of the Confederate Navy's Officer Corps. There's kind of an appendix at the end that identifies every officer who had activity involved in this. And it, there's a citation or a footnote explaining just exactly what their that information comes from. So whether it's their um, obituary in a newspaper that explains certain factors of that they moved us to a certain place or whether it's letters they wrote from Egypt per se or something like that so that we have so I've got the documentation that goes along for every single person that we found um, triggering activity for this so to speak that's crazy so, so as I kind of mentioned before this is just a an overview of why are they worried why are these officers worried after the civil war ends that they need some sort of activity to can move on with their lives um one major factor for this is the, the question of pardons after the Civil War. At the end of the Civil War, most members of the Confederate military received what's called amnesty from the President of the United States, Andrew Johnson. However, senior officers of the Confederate military and government were exempted from that amnesty. They could not receive automatic amnesty and they had to apply for a special oh. pardon from the President. And most Confederate Navy officers were exempted from the amnesty for a number of reasons, um, either because they held prior service in the U.S. Navy or they were a high enough rank or they were involved in um, activity against United States commerce, sinking ships at sea, that kind of thing. Um, so they can't get pardons right. They can't get amnesty right away and they need to apply for a pardon. So many naval officers feel that uh, they're being excluded from society in a certain way by that avenue. Um, combine that with the fact that their naval career is over. They cannot go back to the U.S. Navy. The Confederate Navy no longer exists. Um, that's kind of why the motivation is for a lot of them to seek opportunities outside of the South, away from the military reconstruction going on in the South. So to speak. That's dang. And this, I assume, is like an, I got a real photo that you found of these yes. uh, sailors. So this is a photograph of... Um, Fort Warren in Boston, and uh, it was a place that housed uh, prisoners of war, officers in the Confederate government, um, the everywhere, everyone from high-ranking diplomats. Um, Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens was housed there after the Civil War for a time to uh, low-ranking officers. So these are Navy officers captured from um, both the Confederate ironclad ram Atlanta and the Confederate um, quasi-commerce raiders, Clarence, Taconi, and Archer um, in 1863. So they, uh, one of the few photographs we have of Confederate naval officers in a group, and that's largely because they were prisoners of war in a United States facility where they had access to photograph materials at the time, because the longer the war goes on, the Confederates don't have photograph capabilities as much. Right. It's from scarcity. Dang. Uh, so here's the number for who was in the U.S. Navy before the war. So you mentioned like, where did these uh, officers get expertise from? And again, there's a big disparity here of the higher the rank, the more likely you were to have been in the U.S. Navy before the Civil War. 
And the number is pretty, pretty staggering. 80% of Confederate commissioned line officers in the Navy held positions in the U.S. Navy before the Civil War. Um, it drops off between warrant officers and staff officers, largely because many of the warrant officers are the midshipmen in training at the Confederate Naval Academy. They're teenagers, so they were too young to have prior military or naval service before the Civil War because they joined the Navy as teenagers during the war. Right. And a lot of staff officers are um, doctors or engineers who had civilian experience that were brought into the Navy during the Civil War um, to manage engine and to treat medical conditions and so on. But uh, the number to think of there is uh, that commission line officer number, because those are the officers commanding warships. Those are the officers commanding gun crews and so on. So those are your combat officers, essentially. Wow. So in total, pretty much 598 um, were without you, uh, U.S. naval experience and only 311 had. That's quite a staggering difference. Yeah, so it's a pretty big difference, and um, the reason it's so low comparatively for the grand total is because most officers were either too young or were civilians who joined the Navy during the war because of special skills. Uh, but your career naval officers, almost all of them were um, experienced with the U.S. Navy before the war. Now, another question I want to ask, and this actually was in the back of my mind. Now, um, where was like the a camp or the training facility for the Confederate Navy, because I know in Virginia, the military camp, or the military college in Virginia was like the equivalent to West Point during the Civil War. So for the Confederate Navy, where was that facility to train new sailors? So there's two different approaches to that. Um, Confederate enlisted personnel were enlisted in port cities, and they trained at those port cities on what we call receiving ships. Um, which is just a training ship in each port. So the in New Orleans, the training ship, the receiving ship was this ship called um, St. Philip, and it housed facilities so that crew members who joined the Navy could go there and learn how to operate a ship at sea. And then they would be reassigned to a warship from there. Um, for the Confederacy's officers, there was a Confederate Naval Academy on the James River in Virginia. Um, and it was actually on a warship, the Confederate warship Patrick Henry. And basically mm. what happened is this was an operating warship and the crew was basically most of these uh, midshipmen, these officers in training. And when US Navy warships would approach the James River, the midshipmen would then get passed around to all the other warships in the squadron and then help man all the ships. And then once they were fighting for the day, they would go back to the um, Patrick Henry ship and they would continue their studies for the day. So it's very much a hands-on uh, naval training experience for Confederate sailors. Wow, I didn't know that. That's actually really cool. Yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. Uh, pretty crazy overall. Um, now this takes the uh, officers who are involved in this identity crisis and breaks it down by who had and who did not have prior US Navy experience. And what the large percentage is is most of the officers who struggled in the reconstruction environment, who were part of this crisis that I've labeled, most of them, almost all of them, were prior U.S. Navy officers, uh, which means that statistically, if you were a U.S. Navy officer who joined the Confederate Navy, you were much more likely to struggle in the post-war environment because you had an established career and because that career was now closed to you. And so this is just some statistics that show that. So overall, it's about 65% of all officers who struggled post-war had U.S. naval experience. And as you look at, um, if the, especially with the commissioned line officers, it's almost exclusively all U.S. naval veterans who joined the Confederate Navy who struggled post-war. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I also imagine that Definitely with a lot of that sense of like guilt and that betrayal that you were, you know, you were loyal to the United States before the Civil War, and then joined the Civil War and then starting with the Confederacy and losing. It's like you can't go back to who you were because you're not the same person, as opposed to, you know, those that didn't have prior experience from what this graph is showing me, as well as the others. They had an easier transition because they were loyal to their state, uh, as opposed to those who were.
loyal to um, the United States government, but then turn to join their um, state, which I can also imagine that and coupled with what we now consider uh, post-traumatic stress, definitely, uh, I would imagine, played a huge factor in like, what, what do I do now? Like, who am I? Yeah, so there's a lot of um, those kind of struggles. So uh, an experienced naval officer with decades of experience um, and combat experience, they're going to much more likely wonder, how do I take that skill set and apply it in the civilian world? Whereas a doctor or an engineer who joined the Confederate Navy during the war because everyone was being drafted anyway, so they were going to do something with related to that skill set. Um, after the war, they can continue to be a doctor or an engineer, and that skill set will easily transfer to a railroad company or something else along those matters. So, yeah, the, the, depending on employment pre-war, you know, that affects their post-war employment opportunities, at least in their own minds, of how do they transfer those skills. Right. That, that's incredible. Wow. I can't imagine what those men must have gone through, that sense of who, who, who am I? I mean, I'm a veteran, but I can't receive any uh, benefits and I can't go ask for a pardon because of my rank. Where do I go? Like, who am I? Yeah. So that's um, lots of examples of that. And that's kind of the case study of what we're looking at here. Um, so you mentioned pardons just now. The officers who were involved and classified into this crisis that, that I categorized with uh, triggering information, these are the numbers who actually applied for a pardon. Um, so many officers who went abroad after the war did not even try to apply for a presidential pardon uh, because they felt that it was demeaning, that was it was them admitting defeat. And so that kind of goes into that mindset of PTSD of you lost, now what do you do? So many officers went abroad and then refused to cooperate with the US government by applying for that special pardon, while many right. did, and then waited abroad overseas for it to be um, approved, so to speak. And there, I found cases in the, the National Archives of officers applying two, three, four times, and then the response is, they can't come back. They're not going to be granted one. Um, and so, uh, that becomes a major issue. And uh, the overall stats are about 35% of Confederate naval officers who went abroad or triggered some of these activities that classified them by me into this crisis, about 35% did in fact apply for a presidential pardon, especially on an individual basis, whereas most did not. Um, and again, broken down by ranks, the higher the rank, the more likely they were to apply for a pardon, and that's probably because they um, saw other high-ranking Confederate officers like Robert E. Lee uh, applying for pardons post-war as well. Um, but did all of them receive said pardon? Not specifically. And we'll look at numbers of who's receiving the pardons here in a little bit, too. Wow. And yeah, the, the war and line officers have, like, the uh, mm -hmm. most in terms of, like, old, not apply. And it, it's just – all this is fascinating to me because – I did not know any of this, and we really don't take into uh, consideration or account of, you know, the after effects of the Civil War. I mean, there's so many other stories to be told about this, and what you have here and what you're showing me is one of those stories that doesn't get a lot of recognition, but it has a lot of merit to it, and it's very fascinating to learn and understand. Yeah, and it's important to understand that. Confederate civilians or government agents or members of the Confederate Army experience these same issues. It's just a matter of um, with the Confederate Navy being smaller, I was able to actually look at every single person, whereas you're never going to be able to look at every single member of the Confederate Army. We don't even have lists of every single member of the Confederate Army. Right. Um, there's just so many involved. And so the smaller the group allowed me to do a more focused case study with more precise numbers, so to speak. So that's kind of the standout point here for that. Um, so here's jobs. Here's who did what after the Civil War, at least as far as we know. Um, so I looked at all 794 officers and I wasn't able to find post-war employment for all 794 officers. Um, this is the number for employment that I was able to, to find definitive information on, but it still gives us an overall semblance of things. So um, 
We can see that uh, several died right after the war. Others got involved in government. Um, a large number percentage got involved in uh, farming techniques. And then many others got involved in um, professional categories, white collar professionals. There were 45 officers that were involved in that. And I can and I labeled that as um, clerks or um, professionals working in business and so on. Whereas right. I had another category for like um, more higher educated positions that lawyers, doctors, engineers, educators, so on. Um, the number, the chart on the right there talks about who's working in merchant service. So remember, these are naval officers. They have naval experience. They know how to operate ships. And what's interesting to me is that only about 25% of the officers that I was able to track down have employment after the Civil War in some sort of maritime capacity on a ship or supporting a shipbuilding infrastructure in some way or another. Um, and of those s s officers, only about a quarter of those who did find employment in the sea service did so in the southern states. The rest moved abroad or they moved to the northern states or they moved to the western Pacific coastline, California and whatnot. Uh, and so officers who were in the Navy who wanted to stay in a maritime industry in the South, there were eight of them who managed to do so that I found. And so that's where that crisis comes from of what do I do now? There just aren't as many options. And so many were forced to move elsewhere. Wow. And I don't know whether or not this is true <laughs> back then, because I know the process is now where for those that went into a more maritime trade or service, well, specifically focusing on maritime trade, I imagine they would have to get like a license for like a boat or to show a credential. So in your research, did some of these uh, men fabricate um, their who they were or did they just present their credentials and just hope for the best to see whether or not they could find employment? Uh, I, I didn't find any cases of um, false identities. Now that being said, I'm not saying that's not what happened or didn't happen. It's just going to be harder to track down right. that unless we find some archive that has both names in the same group of letters or something like that. But um, there are cases where officers went abroad, like there are some officers who went to England and had to wait a few years to certify under the British Maritime Trade Unions and Boards. And then they become ship captains in 1867, 1868, 1869, and so on. Uh, because they're going through those certification processes. Others, um, their experience is taken at face value and they're given positions in California and others, their experience is taken at face value and they are recruited into foreign naval services. And uh, we'll look at some examples of them today. Wow, nice. very nice. Uh, so let's talk about what activity was done by these officers. So. Um, Naval officers who were classified into this identity crisis that I've labeled everything as, um, they went through several different examples of how they exhibited that crisis. Um, one example is living abroad, living in exile outside of the former Confederate states in a post-war environment, refusing to stay in the South during Reconstruction. Uh, others went abroad to serve in foreign militaries or naval services, so they're operating in foreign government military activity. Um, another group moves to the Pacific coastline to escape the South and to find employment on the West Coast. Uh, there's a group that does this thing called illicit adventuring. That's like filibustering expeditions or right. more illegal activity, so to speak. And then um, a final category is people who remained in the South or were outside of it, but who wrote documents that espoused early lost cause beliefs. And so uh, we'll see some officers writing just like Confederate Army officers are the early tenants of what will later become the Lost Causes. Yeah, and just talking about just the Foreign Service, you mentioned this previously, or maybe we're about to. For those, uh, let's say, went to England or South America, did they have to? In your research, maybe did they? There were there some who got um, either South American or. English citizenship, even though sort of like a long duration period? Yeah, so um, several officers gained foreign citizenship post-war. 
Um, many of them died in exile, both in England or in Canada or in Colombia. Um, there were officers who chose the exiled life and restarted their lives abroad and never returned to the United States after the war. Wow. That almost sounds very similar to um, the American Revolution where you had those loyal to Great Britain. And they were pretty much just kicked out and they never, ever came back to um, the Americas. They probably went to Great Britain or probably went to Canada or went to another um, territory. So that's a discussion uh, for another time, but it's kind of almost the same thing, this sense of like, who am I? Like, what do I do? Even if you're like a civilian or somebody, you have a better chance to kind of get your life together. But if you're a career soldier from the US military and then joining the Confederacy, losing, that's kind of hard to do. And your options are very, very limited. Yeah, so um, I, I like the allegory you made of um, post-U.S. Revolutionary War with many people who did leave New York City and move to Canada after the war. Um, when the British evacuated New York in 1783 and early 84, they brought thousands of civilian refugees to Canada with them um, who chose to not stay in the United States because they were loyal subjects of Great Britain. So that's a good allegory of people having to make the tough choices of do I stay or do I go and what are the consequences of that? So I like that idea. Thank you. Uh, so here's the actual who was abroad and why they were abroad and when they were abroad. Uh, so the, the, the easiest thing to tell you is that between 1865 and 1877, more Confederate naval officers were abroad for many different reasons. After 1877, the number of Confederate naval officers who were abroad outside of the South drops. And it drops because over time, the U.S. government um, updates its amnesty policies. And so in 1865, there's an initial amnesty proclamation. It gets updated in 1867. And when military reconstruction formally ends um, after the election of Rutherford Hayes in 1877, when he takes office, uh, then more Confederate naval officers who are abroad start to choose to return. Um, and that could be for a number of reasons. One could be they felt safer in a South post reconstruction as, um, you know, uh, Southerners are gaining, white Southerners are gaining more control of their, their local governments again. Or as you can see, the number of foreign military activity begins to drop. It could just be that these naval officers are getting older and they don't want to be doing active naval campaigning. They want to go into a more retired phase of their lives. And right. So feel like, oh, the war is over. Reconstruction's over. I'm getting old. I'm going to return to my home state finally 10 years later, so to speak. Uh, so, but as you can see, even as far as 1905, I've tracked it, there are still a number of Confederate naval officers, even in the 1900s, that are abroad outside of the South or on the Pacific coastline, and they've chosen to permanently stay there. Wow. That, that is really crazy. So by our standards and using the modern term, they would be like an expat uh, or an expatriate. Absolutely. So it's either an, an expatriate status or they've chosen um, to gain citizenship in the, the country they have moved to and thus um, have become citizens, giving up their U.S. citizenship uh, because of that whole question of amnesty and pardons completely. Wow. wow. That's wild. Uh, so let's look at some examples of who we're talking about in numbers here. Um, there are clusters of Confederate naval officers who we know were in foreign countries. Uh, the largest cluster is England, mm -hmm. um, but there are clusters in many other places. Um, the, the cluster in England largely concentrated in the city of Liverpool, where Confederate naval agents and officers uh, kept headquarters at during the Civil War. So all the commerce raiders, uh, their officers largely gathered in Liverpool. They, they built ships in the Liverpool area. And so that's an obvious place where many naval officers clustered after the war. Uh, the second largest cluster I found was in Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada, uh, where which was also a haven for blockade runners and commerce raiders during the war, just because of its location. Many naval officers, several went to Mexico after the war um, to live in a civilian capacity. Uh, and I'll look at examples of that in a minute. 
Uh, others went to Argentina. Uh, more specifically, officers from the Confederate Commerce Raider Shenandoah, the last Confederate ship to surrender, many of their junior officers went to go far, start a farm, a ranch in Argentina. And they were in Argentina. They kept applying for presidential pardons and they kept being told, no, you can't get one. No, you can't get one. Um, and so they stayed in Argentina for over a decade, just trying to um, figure out what to do. And these are like 22, 23, 24 year old kids, essentially, who are just like, what do I do next? They ended the war in England. They told they can't go home. And so they all moved to Argentina, a large group. Uh, others went to France, some went to Germany, a couple to Colombia. Uh, one naval officer went to Brazil, and I mentioned him as not necessarily a cluster, but um, he went with other Confederate officials, and they tried to start the whole plantation economy in Brazil. Uh, the one naval officer actually wrote notes to other people trying to get them to come to his location in Brazil because he had already managed to restart a plantation with enslaved labor because slavery is still legal in Brazil up until the 1870s. Okay. And so, uh, I mentioned him because other Confederates go to Brazil, about 10,000 Confederates total end up in Brazil. Uh, only one naval officer that I tracked down, but uh, he's got serious um, weight in trying to get other people to move there because he does manage to successfully bring that uh, plantation economy back there, at least for him personally for a time. Dang, that's crazy. And curious, in your research, like why England was probably, why was England the most popular for um the foreign exiles? Like what about England was so important to Confederacy? I know there is a story um about Queen Elizabeth wanting um the cotton uh for uh money and also for the silk uh for Great Britain's economy. And if I remember correctly, and, and you can always stop me if I'm wrong. But the story is that the Confederacy tried to hold out on the cotton so that way they could, like, tempt the British to, like, send them men, send them money, and send them supplies. But the Union got word of this and told them, hey, you can make the same material in, I think, Tripoli or North Africa for a cheaper price, and it's geographically closer. And I think England took that deal, and as a result, the South lost a year's worth of cotton, which by that time in that period was like a lot of money. Yeah, so the Confederacy did try, it's called cotton diplomacy was the um, government strategy, which they tried to self embargo cotton at the beginning of the Civil War uh, to force a scarcity and a run on cotton so that European governments, particularly Britain and France who had large textile mills uh, to force them to try to recognize the Confederacy and break the U.S. blockade um, so that they would then get access to that cotton. It failed for a couple of reasons. One was um, that the 1860 cotton crop was very large. There was a surplus. And by the time the Civil War started and the blockade began, European textile mills were still using the surplus from the previous year. And so they didn't feel those ramifications immediately. Mm, okay. um, and then... They did, in fact, turn to other sources, especially Britain. They turned to Egypt and they turned to India, which also mm. grew cotton. The cotton was not um, as top quality, you could say, as cotton from the, the southern United States, but it was still cotton. It still existed and there was no war going on where you had to fight to get to it. And so um, by the time the cotton in Egypt and India was being brought to Britain in larger numbers, that's around the same time that the uh, surplus of 1860 starts going away. And there's a very small window where the um, British and French textile mill owners and business leaders are hounding their government to break the blockade out of desperate necessity. Now, did that hounding continue throughout the war? Yes, uh, but it never got to the point where the British were ready to try to actively cause hostilities with the United States to get access to trade goods. Um, another reason England is because, um, well, number one, everybody speaks English, so that's an easy one. Number two, um, many British civilians joined the Confederate Navy on ships. And so there was uh, the fact that many commerce raiders, like the Confederate commerce raider Alabama, had a largely European crew um, because the ship was built in Europe and then manned in Europe secretly. Uh, so it's just, and there's some connections where some naval officers might have felt more comfortable there because they had been there during the war. 
they already knew the area. They knew some local uh, people because they had served in the Confederate Navy with them. And so that's kind of some reasons why clusters would begin in England, I would say. Dang. That makes sense. It does make sense. I mean, there's a lot of movies and a lot of books where there was um, uh, Miller attaches from the uh, Great Britain and the UK joining the Confederacy. So it does make a lot of sense. It is important. And again, it is fascinating to learn about this. Mm -hmm. um, so foreign government service is not exile. This is people who entered the military or the Navy of a foreign country. Um, and they're divided by multiple different countries, uh, the largest of which is Egypt and Colombia. And then after that, we have Peru, Argentina, Mexico. A couple of sailors went to multiple countries, um, Egypt plus uh, Spain plus uh, Prussia, for example, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many different categories, but the largest concentrations are Egypt, Peru, uh, and Colombia for who was in a foreign navy. And I've got some examples uh, to share with you. The largest, Peru, is the most interesting to me, and that's because Confederate naval officers were deliberately recruited by Peru's government at the end of the Civil War to come to Peru and lead their naval force. So um, the background of this is that while our Civil War, the U.S. Civil War, was going on, Peru was fighting a war with um, Spain. Spain was trying to resurge itself in Latin America, um, they had already retaken control of some islands in the Caribbean, and they were trying to expand into uh, what had become all the countries of South America again. And so when the Civil War ends, people are looking in Latin America for experienced officers who know how to fight. And many of them turn to the Confederate Navy and go, hey, do you want a job? Let's go. And many Confederate naval officers decide to go to these foreign governments in Latin America. Uh, in Peru, that's where we get the highest ranking Confederate naval officer who goes abroad and serves in a foreign government, Captain John Tucker. Uh, he was a captain in the Confederate Navy who becomes an admiral in Peru's Navy. And he brings several officers with him who end up commanding um, warships during the Civil War or right. not during, the war, during Peru's war against Spain. Um, and then what's interesting to me is that after they fight these wars with Spain, then Tucker and many of his officers leave the Peru Navy and then join and become the leaders of the Peruvian Hydrographical Commission, which kind of maps the, the headwaters of the Amazon River. And so they're doing survey work as well as uh, military naval work. So it's kind of interesting. And they all stay in Peru until military reconstruction ends in the south. And then when that ends, they all mysteriously go, oh, let's go back to Virginia and so on or South Carolina and they're <laughs> in a big group. So it's kind of interesting. Nice. Yeah. That's interesting. Peru, of all places in um, South America, Peru. You know, I would, I would never think. But then again, there are some things about history we don't know. So this guy, Captain John R. Tucker, becomes a rear admiral. Now, what was, in your research, which you'll probably show with the other um, foreign services, what was, like, the Navy like or, like, the strength of foreign navies? Um, as opposed to the military strength of both the Confederacy and the Union during like the 1860s and into the 1870s and 1880s. So it's hard to compare it to the U.S. Navy because when the, the Civil War ends, the U.S. Navy is the largest naval force in the world, um, even larger than the Royal Navy at that point. But wow. compared to other navies, the, what might be surprising to a lot of people is that South American countries, their naval forces were actually quite strong. They had ironclad warships. They had wooden frigates. They had wooden corvettes that were steam powered. They were modern ships that were built using the same technology. And in some cases, it's the very same ships that were called for service in the U.S. Civil War operating. So, for example, in Peru, um, two warships were built in England for the Confederate Navy, and they were confiscated by the British government when um, diplomatic issues started to arise. And the British government wanted to make money off the ships that were built, and so they sold them to Peru. And so it's not just Peru, it's not just Confederate naval officers; it was ships also intended for the Confederate Navy that make the journey to Peru and then take part in these conflicts. So it's pretty weird stuff. That is actually pretty cool, though. Very, very fascinating. 
like I said, know nothing of naval history, especially around this time, but this is really fascinating. And I imagine there are other fascinating stories for the other countries as well in your research. Yeah, absolutely. There's many other um, stories. A second one I like to talk about a lot is Egypt. So after the Civil War, um, the leader of Egypt, which was part of the Ottoman Empire at the time, was trying to gain more autonomy and perhaps even gain independence from the Ottoman Empire. And so the leader of Egypt tried to recruit officers from the Civil War, both United States and Confederate Army and Navy officers, to go to Egypt to command and operate and train uh, the Egyptian military. And many officers did. Uh, 48 officers from the Civil War, both North and South, um, Navy and Army, joined Egypt's military. Eight of those 48 were members of the Confederate Navy during the Civil War. And I have there who those eight are and what their jobs were. So some of them became very low ranking people. Um, James Morgan was just a teenager during our Civil War, and he became a colonel in the Egyptian Marines who became an aide to the leader of Egypt. Um, but others rose to very high ranking positions. Alexander Mason became governor of Equatorial Africa. Um, wow. High ranking position. Um, uh, Charles Graves commanded a warship in Egypt's Navy. Um, Beverly Kennan, who's pictured there, became a colonel who was awarded a medal for his innovation in developing coastal artillery defenses for Egypt's government. Um, and so, again, for an, about 15 years after the Civil War, these officers are abroad. And it's not just naval officers, it's Army officers and U.S. and Confederate, but they're all abroad in Egypt trying to figure out what to do with their lives and trying to take their skill set and apply it to a place that might be useful and um, trying to find purpose within themselves all at the same time. Uh, but again, around 1875 to 1880, as the Egyptian leader's government collapses, as the Ottoman Empire gains more strength, um, they slowly start returning to the United States in a, in a capacity. Some of them would die overseas um, from military activity or accidents or disease, but most of them ended up returning to the United States. Wow. Um, and I imagine for those that may have stayed in Egypt for whatever or so reasons or anywhere else as foreign service, I wonder what, or maybe you may have found this in like personal diaries of these men of like transitioning from an American way of life to a foreign way of life. Have you ever uncovered that in your research? Uh, so there were struggles. I mean, language is obviously a struggle. People going to Egypt, religion is going to be a struggle. Um, and so just trying to balance that with the fact that they are newcomers to an area um, versus do they try to project themselves as um, above all of that because they're being sought out for their skill set. There's this, so there's this balancing act of people who are trying to um, assimilate to a local area versus not. And uh, overall, it, it's back and forth. Many officers who moved to Latin America spoke Spanish. They tried to integrate themselves into society, especially if they stayed there on a permanent basis. Um, as you can see, these officers in Egypt, you know, they wore Egyptian style clothing with um, while they were in service there. So they did assimilate in some ways, though maybe not always in others. Uh, so it's it's a back and forth on that. Nice. Very nice. Um, Mexico is another one worth mentioning because another senior Confederate naval officer, Matthew Fontaine Mori, who's a scientist, as the Civil War ends, he refuses to return to the United States. He's in England when the war ends, and he moves to Mexico because he actually knows Emperor Maximilian, the new leader that the French-backed government installed in Mexico in the 1860s. He knows them. He's a friend of Maximilian. And Maximilian in Mexico actually offers Mori a job. And that job is the commissioner of colonization. And he's basically in charge of trying to recruit people from the South to move to Mexico after the war to stabilize this Maximilian-backed French government and to um, basically provide land grants for people in Mexico for all these Southerners who are trying to lead the South in a post-war environment. And it's everybody from high-ranking generals to low-ranking enlisted members of, of the Confederate Army who do move to Mexico post-war. And this man, Maury, helped facilitate a lot of that movement. Wow. And since you brought up uh, Mexico, especially Maximilian, because 
that's another aspect of like the civil war history that no one really considers. Um, there's a lot of stories that and uh, articles and scholarship journals that state that Maximilian was possibly trying to aid the Confederacy by possibly, as one story goes, I was reading back in my undergrad and graduate school, that he was trying to give men to uh, the Confederacy via Mexico. And the only reason why he was stopped, among many other things, was the um, the Franco-Mexican War that stopped him, as well as, of course, him dying in Mexico City. It's a very fascinating period of history, but... Yeah, I did not consider uh, the Confederacy after the Civil War in Mexico and then trying to, especially with Matthew here, to say, hey, come over here. This is a place to start over. This is a new opportunity for us. Yeah, it's really weird because there are even entire formations of Confederate military units at the end of the war who refuse to surrender. And they're in Texas and Louisiana, and they literally ride to the Texas-Mexico border, across the border, and then just go, hey, Maximilian, we're your own private army now. We, we want to join the Mexican army. We have an entire regiment of soldiers trained and equipped and ready to go. Um, wow. Because they're willing to, you know, find work, escape the United States. They're trying to avoid post-war um, tribunals or anything like that. And they're not sure what's going to happen as all these surrenders happen as the war ends. So thousands of Confederates move to Mexico and many of them move and get land grants and try to find um, stability through Matthew Fontaine at Maury. Now, Maury only stays in Mexico until the collapse of Maximilian's government in 1867 because he's a friend with Maximilian. And so when the Juarez government in Mexico regains control of the country and uh, Maximilian gets executed, Maury kind of says, I better get out of this place before I end up at yeah. the <laughs> firing squad too. And so he will return to Virginia around 1867-68 to uh, resettle mm -hmm. on a more permanent basis. Fascinating. Very fascinating <laughs> indeed. Um, okay, so the next category is relocation outside of the South, but not abroad, but to um, the Pacific coastline. And uh, it's interesting to me because many of the officers who found jobs on the Pacific coastline did so on ships. And those very ships were the ships that they were trying to capture during the Civil War. Uh, so they all find jobs as part of the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, which was a target of the Confederate Navy during the Civil War because the Pacific Mail Steamship Company was one of the shipping companies that carried gold from California to Panama, and then another company carried it from Panama to New York. And so during the war, they had instructions to capture these ships because they were full of gold, and then they could use that to fund the Confederate war effort. And then after the war is over, many of them moved to California and then get jobs on the very same ships that they were trying to capture during the war. It's pretty <laughs> weird. Yeah, and that whole story is with stealing the goal or Confederate goal. That's a story as old as time. Yeah. But it is really interesting seeing these men, these photos here of them trying to, you know, start a better life. And I see one of the points um, you say, um, nautical jobs available without the stigma of northern relocation. Could you go more um, in detail about that? Absolutely. So. Many at the time in the 1860s saw the West as still the frontier. Even California was still a frontier for many people, even though it was a state and had been an established state since the 1850s. And so many naval officers chose, well, if I have to move to get out of the South, I would rather move to the Pacific coastline where people may not know who I am, or it might be easier to blend in with others. Whereas if they move to New York or Boston to get a job in maritime trade, those were the same people in Boston, New York, who were reading the newspapers about these Confederate officers capturing and destroying their merchant ships from New York and Boston during the war. And so people knew in New York who William H. Parker was, um, but people in California might not know who William H. Parker was because his ship did not go to California, did not operate in the Pacific Ocean. And so it might have been an easier pill to swallow, so to speak, for naval officers to move to California or Washington or Oregon because they're just not going to be as well known and it provides them an opportunity to start over. Another reason is because a large number of people in California during the Civil War and immediately after are Southerners. 
California, I said, is a state that joins the United States in 1850 as a state. Uh, when the Civil War begins, upwards of 25% of the state's population are people born in the southern states who migrated during the gold rush and so on. And right. so there was a large enclave of people in New York, in uh, Los Angeles who were Southerners or who had pro-Southern sentimentalities. And so many people moved to the Pacific because they could go, well, I'll just live with other Southerners who moved to the Pacific Ocean. And then it's easier for me to reestablish myself in this place without the stigma of moving to the place, the northern states that militarily defeated me, so to speak. And, and not to mention that most of the southern states were still under reconstruction and almost all the southern states were like pretty much in like shambles. And so under military occupation, it's like I will have a better, easier time to start anew in an area that has its own set of challenges. But one of those challenges is not the federal government trying to, from the southern perspective, trying to control me. Yeah. So uh, California did have a lot of United States soldiers in it during the Civil War. There were as many as 50,000 Californians who volunteered for the U.S. military during the war. But as the war ends, those volunteers go away. They're not staying to occupy California because they don't need to. And so there is not as much of a military presence in California like there is going to be in Texas and Louisiana and South Carolina and so on. So that's another factor worth considering, as you said. Nice. Fascinating. Very fascinating indeed. <clears throat> uh, the next category of people who are trying to figure out what to do is illicit adventuring. These are filibusters or people who undertake uh, not so legal activity. Um, some are going to try to command ships on behalf of Cuban people who are trying to rebel against the Spanish government. Um, Hillary Senas tries to organize a ship full of people that goes to Mexico to filibuster in the post Maximilian when Juarez retakes control of Mexico. They try to filibuster to overthrow the Juarez government again, and that fails. Um, Charles and Edmund Reed bring a ship to Columbia, the ship R.R. Sewler, um, which was a ship during the Civil War. And then at the end of the war, they bring it to Columbia. And then there's a lot of back and forth where they end up almost getting killed because they're trying to sell the, the, the ship to the Colombian government. And then they try to resell the ship to Colombian rebel groups and to recapture the ship on behalf. And there's a lot of back and forth there. Uh, the largest illicit adventuring, the one that gained the most headlines, is uh, Joseph Fry, who was involved in the Virginius incident, which is a ship that was trying to smuggle Cuban rebel leaders into Cuba with weapons to try to arm local Cuban populations to overthrow the Spanish government. The ship gets captured by the Spanish Navy. And uh, the picture on the background here, the man shaking hands there tied up, that is Joseph Fry and the members of his ship that were captured by the Spanish government and executed. So uh, wow. this is seen as a pre-building element at the end of military reconstruction that, um, you know, a generation later when the USS Maine explodes in Havana Harbor to start the Spanish-American War, a lot mm -hmm. of people during the Maine incident and its aftermath are looking at the Virginia's incident of Americans were killed during that time too. The Spanish government has been fighting Cuban rebels for a generation. And so this kind of brings a lot of connections to people a generation later in the 1890s uh, to foster that yellow journalism that's going to help make the U.S. government declare war in 1898. Yeah, and that's actually interesting. Um, now, for those that don't know the term uh, yellow uh, journaling, uh, could you uh, go a little bit in depth on that term? Yeah, so yellow journalism is just the idea that um, journalists would go abroad to foreign countries in the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, and find news stories that they could print that would generate headlines in the United States. Um, uh, there were muckrakers acting internally in the United States at the time, and that's um, like Upton Sinclair, right, investigating the meat processing facilities. Yellow mm -hmm. journalists are kind of doing the same thing abroad. So um, some yellow journalists, um, like Joseph Pulitzer, they'd go to Cuba and they would talk and look at Cuban rebel groups and the, the camps that Spanish government leaders were building to house these Cuban rebel groups. And uh, they would show photographs of them in the newspapers to generate anti-Spanish, pro-Cuban sympathies to try to push the U.S. to taking action against the Spanish government. 
uh, so that they would become a more independent country or so that we could annex Cuba later on. Yeah, and also uh, to help uh, rake in some profits because of like the headlines and all that stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Pictures of people 90 miles from the U.S. coast that are struggling in camps generates sales of newspapers and magazines for sure. So, uh, you know, there's definitely the profit motiva motivation there, too. Yeah. And definitely um, before we go into the next slide, the picture definitely holds like a lot of like it's very romanticized in like in like the picture and like these brave Americans um, trying to do some good and then about to be killed by the ruthless Spanish. I can imagine some journalists in like the 1880s, 1890s writing something along those lines to garner some sentiment from the American people and also try to push the U.S. government to get involved in the Caribbean uh, for the islands of Cuba and yeah. the other Spanish held islands. Yeah, so these the pictures that come from the Virginia's incident are very reminiscent of what would turn into yellow journalism pictures later on in that they're trying to portray uh, the Cuban rebels and the Americans helping them as the victims. They're trying to showcase that the Cuban people want independence from colonial Spain. Um, so it's part U.S. is trying to maintain the Monroe Doctrine um, to keep European governments out of North America. And it's part uh, we want to be the dominant factor in North America. And look, they're killing Americans and people we like. We need to oppose the Spanish government. So it's definitely trying to create that anti-Spanish sentiment in the United right. States. Yeah, and it definitely works. And I actually am intrigued for the next slide too, because if it's what I think it is, that's gonna be a great discussion. Yes, this one I've been really interested to hear about this one, the lost cause um, aspect. Yeah, so the lost cause is um, the ideas that formed after the Civil War that um, Confederate leaders are trying to frame the narrative as to why the southern states seceded and formed the confederacy and then why they lost and so there's kind of two elements to the lost cause one is that um it was a lost part and the second is that it's a cause the lost part is that the confederate states after the war proclaimed they never had a prayer of a chance of winning the war um these are where you get statements of you know robert e lee's army surrendered and they had you know 20,000 soldiers and they were facing Ulysses Grant with 100,000 soldiers and Robert E. Lee's soldiers didn't even have shoes and Grant's soldiers had modern equipment and um, you know some of all of that there's truth to it uh, but um, the whole part of like the Confederacy could never win this war it was a lost cause it was a cause that could not be won um, kind of helps shield the blow of the fact that the southern states lost this conflict the Confederacy lost it and so they're trying to make up for the fact that they lost the war by saying, well, we couldn't have won anyway after the fact. Uh, the second element is the cause part, which is trying to frame the narrative uh, that the war was not about trying to push the expansion of slavery and to push the Southern states and pro-slavery groups in the United States to maintain power because they had maintained power in the government for basically the entire existence of the United States to that point. And the Abraham Lincoln administration's um, election in 1860 kind of was the nail in the coffin that the rest of the United States could outvote the Southerners in this pro-slavery versus anti-slavery agenda. And that's kind of Lincoln's election was the triggering point that triggered the secession movement. And so people are gonna take part in this laws cause activity uh, throughout the South. And, and you know this, this uh, mythology still exists to this day. And these members of the Confederate Navy, that we have members who are going to take active parts in government bureaucracy and active parts in trying to uh, write about it and try to create that cause through uh, literature. Um, so the first part is politics. And what we have is that many former Confederate naval officers get gain leadership roles in Southern politics after the war, particularly after military reconstruction is over with. Um, many of these are low-ranking officers in the Confederate Navy, uh, mainly because the higher the rank, the more likely they are to be in, in an age of retirement or they're dead by the time that Southerners, white Southerners, are regaining control of their local governments after Reconstruction. Uh, but we have people who are becoming congressmen, um, 
state adjutant general and so on, John Kell, the adjutant general of Georgia. Um, he was appointed by a member of the Ku Klux Klan to be mm -hmm. the adjutant general of Georgia. So, um, you know, they're espousing these pro-Democrat, pro-white Southern beliefs while they're in office to try to maintain that pro-Anglo Southern dominance of the Southern states in a post-reconstruction environment. Yeah, and it is interesting because I first learned about the Lost Cause is actually from um, the movie, uh, the Civil War movie of Gods and Generals. When I watched it the first time, it was a very interesting movie. Not only did it talk about, um, one of the things I did like about the movie, it showed the Confederate side of the war. But what's interesting, if you look at that movie from like the Lost Cause perspective, you can actually see, oh, that's actually what they're trying to say saying it wasn't about the um, continual use of the slave system. It was the protection of states' rights and the state's autonomy and who the states are. The thing with that, if you break it down the lost cause, but what was the state's rights? What was their identity? Well, most of their infrastructure and their economy was based upon slavery and cotton. So it's very, very hard to say separated to it's like oh no it wasn't this when in truth it was but as you said this lost cause narrative and myth is still known to us uh today which is it's very fascinating how uh narrative that was made so many years ago no so many decades or centuries ago is still uh prevalent to us and do you think it's because um based off your research for these men and all those men after is that sort of like after the old generation of like the six, the fifties and sixties sort of passed away and the new generation was being born. This is what they were being told to, doesn't matter if you were in the Southern states or even in the Northern states. Uh, yeah. So the, the lost cause gained a lot of ground in the 1880s and nineties when a lot of these uh, veterans from the civil war from the Confederate standpoint are aging and they want to, pass on narratives to the next generation to prove that you know they fought in this war and lost but it had a purpose there was a point to it instead of just you know oh grandpa fought in the war well what was the war about well we don't want to talk about that because it's not very good you know they were on the right. wrong side of that conflict looking back at it and so this lost cause pushes through this narrative of oh they fought for you know nobility noble reasons reasons for state sovereignty, reasons other than to own property in the property of other human beings, so that um, aging veterans could feel like they did something that was worthwhile and so that they could pass that knowledge on to their children and their grandchildren. And then that same knowledge is still being passed around. And so it's a lot of, um, a lot of elements of the lost cause are, well, my grandparents, my, my ancestors, my great, great, great grandparents participated in this conflict and they did so for a real reason. It wasn't just that they got caught up in the moment and it wasn't just that they were taken advantage of. Um, and it wasn't that they were forcibly drafted into the Confederate military to fight because the Confederacy had a draft as well. It was for other reasons. It's all about placing purpose to why people are doing things. And um, in the Southern United States, even today, uh, finding purpose in why people are fighting in this civil war is a major factor to understand. And a lot of people are still trying to find out whether or not that purpose needs to exist or not um, in their mind to justify it. Mm, yeah, it does in some way from the Southern perspective during this time after the civil war kind of softens the blow of like, you know, what really happened to try to give a sense, like I just said, since it's like noble nobility, a sense of honorable fighting, it, it, it is. And I always wonder if these men who fought for the Confederacy ever felt in their own private moments a sense of like shame that, you know, we lost this war, but also like, was it really a war that was worth fighting? Well, sorry to say it, but there's not that many letters or diary entries where people are questioning their own motives in that fashion. So that's going to be right. a question that largely gets left in the open, up in the air. Right. Um, because the writings we do have are very much a pro uh, lost cause sentimentality. And that's kind of the next part here is that we have these writings that many Confederate officers, naval officers did 
Uh, many of them wrote memoirs, many of them wrote articles. Um, 10 Confederate art articles are written in the Battles and Leaders of the Civil War series after the war uh, by Confederate naval officers that have these lost cause sentimentalities. 10 articles are written in the Confederate Veteran Magazine that espouse these same sentimentalities by Confederate naval officers. Uh, two naval officers write articles in the Southern Historical Society papers that have the same sentiments. And then at least another eight memoirs are written by naval officers of the Confederacy where there are passages that we can quote that tell you that they are specifically thinking on in a lot. Now their memoirs may be very good for giving us information about what happened. And that's explaining, you know, the day-to-day -day life of what they were doing. Uh, but in their introductions or at some point in the book, you can find them saying something specific that shows you they are trying to frame the narrative as a pro-Southern, pro-lost cause sentimentality. And so I have some examples of that here. So um, Raphael Sims is, uh, was a rear admiral in the Confederate Navy, commanded the Confederate Commerce Raider Alabama, um, became the second highest ranking Confederate naval officer during the war. And uh, when he wrote his memoirs in 1869, um, in, in page 69, the first chunk of his memoir is basically a legal defense, because he was also a trained lawyer, a legal defense of Southern institutions and why the Southern states chose to secede. And um, what he comes down to is that uh, Northern states, the Northern part of the country, essentially backed the Southern states into a corner over this question of slavery. And there was nothing left to do at that point except to accept the gauntlet. He's basically making an analogy that this is a duel between the two parts of the country and that the Southern states were backed into a corner and forced to fight this civil war to an extent. Wow. Um, John Wilkinson uh, commanded some Confederate warships. He commanded the Confederate uh, transport Robert E. Lee. He commanded uh, Confederate commerce raiders, and then after the war settled in Halifax, Nova Scotia in exile for a time, uh, he wrote his narrative of a blockade runner towards the end of the century, and he declared the Confederacy a, quote, holy cause, uh, which should be proclaimed in the interest of truth and justice. So he's saying that the Confederacy's cause is holy and needs to be told to other people so that, um, you know, the, the lost cause, the truth can come out and so that justice can be done to this Confederate identity of uh, the post-war environment and the uh, memory of the war. Um, Arthur Sinclair served on Confederate commerce raiders, and he literally says the lost cause in his introduction to his book. He says that this explanation is not to be construed. It's hoped into an apology. Whatever is fitting for others, it's highly indecorous for a person in the present position of him as a writer to make excuses there is this thing called a lost cause. And he goes into detail explaining what this lost cause is and why the cause he fought for was lost and why it's important to remember it. Uh, so like it's, and if you don't read the introductions of the book all the time, you're gonna not see this. You're just gonna see his, you know, oh, and on March 18th, we captured this ship and burned it, so to speak. Uh, but if you look into the intros a little bit more, you can see, a little bit more into what they're thinking as naval officers and how they're framing it both within their own identity but also um the the entire southern state trying to cope with this lost conflict that they did not succeed in right um and then the last element of this lost cause is the confederate navy survivors association so this is think of it as like the veterans of foreign wars of the american legion except it's for members of the confederate navy it was formed late in the 1800s, um, early 1900s, as these veterans are uh, much older. And it basically just became a way for Confederate Navy veterans to get together and to trade sea stories and to talk about the battles they were in and they were to, to remain in contact with one another. And they would have annual meetings. Uh, the first annual meeting was in South Carolina. There were other annual meetings. Um, this guy uh, right there, he became kind of the leader of the Naval Survivors Association for a couple of decades, um, sort of the last major person in charge of it. And they did a lot of things. They um, sent out pamphlets so that people who were members of the Confederate Navy could send in basically an abbreviated service records. And they compiled those service records to try and form a roster of people who were in the Confederate Navy and their histories so that they could be used later. 
they lobbied for benefits for Confederate naval veterans, such as getting like, um, you know, free transportation on the local subway system later on um, in certain towns, like in Atlanta or something like that. Um, they printed these veterans pamphlets. Now, the part that gets them to um, the lost cause element is two things. Number one is one of the benefits they lobbied for was to reframe how Confederate naval officers were classified by the United States Navy. Um, mm. So when the Civil War began, many U.S. naval officers who were leaving to join the Confederate Navy, the way they left was they resigned their commissions from the United States Navy. They sent a letter to the leader of the U.S. Navy, the Secretary of the Navy in Washington, D.C., saying, I want to leave the United States Navy, and here's why. And uh, two things could happen at that point. The Secretary of the U.S. Navy could either accept the resignation and let them leave in peace, or what happened is, as the Civil War began, is that the Secretary of the Navy refused to accept those res resignations and instead dismissed those officers from the Navy. So one is basically you putting in your two weeks notice saying, I want to quit, and dismissal from the U.S. Navy is no, you're fired instead. And so one wow. sounds wow. more honorable and the other one, the dismissal sounds like a much more dishonorable way to leave the U.S. Navy. And um, what happened is that these Naval Survivors Association members, they tried to lobby the U.S. government to reclassify all the Confederate naval officers who were dismissed from the U.S. Navy to reclassify them as having been resigned from the U.S. Navy instead. And part of that was because if officers were declared resigned from the U.S. Navy instead of dismissed, they could get certain benefits from the U.S. government around the turn of the century. And so it's all about trying to grab benefits. But it's also framing the narrative of these men didn't do something dishonorable. What they did was honorable as well. Um, and then the other way was that uh, one, the, the first secretary of the Confederate Navy Survivors Association, William Clayton, he actually wrote a history of the Confederate Navy, one of the first ones. And he did it so that he could, quote, fix the spirit of misinterpretation or omission from northern authors, meaning northerners are writing a history of the Civil War that is misinterpreting the war, misinterpreting the naval aspect in this case. And he wants to write a history of the Confederate Navy to fix that misinterpretation. Mm. So it's all about framing that post-war narrative um, and the memory of the war overall. Wow. That's, that's, that's crazy, crazy, but it is fascinating to see, you know, the great lengths they, they try to do to, like, you know, make not just make themselves relevant, but try to have, like, a form of, like, a stable life for themselves and for their families. And we have to realize and understand that history and look at these men as men of who they were. They did what they did, what they thought was right. And, you know, in the modern sense, we can judge them based upon our modern uh, modern society norms now. But at that time, what they believed was truly just. And it's kind of hard to uh, judge them based upon that. And I always find it very interesting, which is, one of the things my professor asked us is that when we look at history, we always tend to judge it from the perspective of now. But if we were at that time period as ourselves, would we have those same opinions? Probably not. We'd probably be more uh, sympathetic to the major policies or the discussions at that time. So it is very fascinating and also important to recognize that. Yeah, so we all have our own biases. Um, even historians who do research, we try to say that we're not biased because we're using the resources given to us, uh, the, the, the primary account, everything. Uh, but historians have our own biases. You know, it's very hard to find a historian today who's going to say, you know, slavery was a good thing. That's a bias. Admitting that slavery is a bad thing is a bias in ourselves. Um, probably a good one to, to admit, you know, but um, right. but recognizing that even a historian has an implicit bias one way or the other regarding all of these factors can help understand uh, why they're writing certain things, why they're researching certain things, but also how things are being framed. And as long as we kind of recognize that we do have biases and that how we interpret evidence um, you know, we have to take things through the lens of what we're seeing versus the lens of how we live today. And uh, it's very complex stuff. And, uh, you know, it's important that we at least recognize that there are complexities here. And, you know, no one's trying to make excuses for what people did. 
in the past, um, one way or the other, whether it's good or bad. But uh, it's important that we recognize that, you know, how we interpret things today is different than how people interpreted things in the past. And as long as we know that, we can frame how we interpret things through that lens of the past. And then we can also understand why people are motivated to take actions at the time as well. So lots of complexities there. Definitely, especially yeah. for a topic like this, which you this could be discussed in more ways than one through different perspectives and different lenses. Oh, absolutely. Um, that being said, that's the end of my presentation. We can just go back and forth talking now. But uh, if you like what you heard from me and you want to learn more about me, um, my email or my uh, website is neilpchatelaine.com. You can find me at the Emerging Civil War website or you can check out um, any of my written works, my books, and so on. Um, but that, I'll stop sharing the screen, and we can do a back and forth face-to-face -face on whatever else you want to talk about, you know? All right. That's actually good. So, yeah, there's a few questions I did want to ask before mm -hmm. while we did end our um, discussion, which is what was probably um, the initial idea for this um, um, thesis and for this uh, project? Did it initially start off as post-war of uh, identity crisis or was it something else that kind of led to this? Uh, this was kind of a hodgepodge of other things that I had been looking at. So for other projects, I would look at um, elements and over time I would see recurring things like, oh, this person was in Halifax too. Oh, this person was in Halifax as well. Um, and so it was just kind of like disparate elements that over time merged into this idea of, wow, a lot of naval officers did this. And we know that army officers and government leaders did the same things. You know, um, I had already known about the Confederates in Egypt, for example. Um, I knew many people had gone to Mexico after the war. Uh, but uh, over time, I kind of gathered all these differing elements because it's lots of different things that I merged into one big category. And right. what I noticed was that if you could add everything up, it's a huge percentage. A third of Confederate line officers were involved in this, senior naval officers. And they, you know, and it's hard to classify the numbers for the military, the army side. And so I wanted, I felt that it was important that we look at that through a lens of numbers where we could interpret it with more specific numbers. And so uh, I felt that it was worth checking that out to add to this whole uh, mentality of this longer civil war and this post war struggle. Uh, just to add to that a little bit. And speaking of like the long yeah. civil war and all that discussion, what do you hope uh, with this uh, episode and this discussion that we're having, what do you hope to uh, have it do for uh, historians that are watching this or history enthusiasts who are studying uh, American history or those that are learning about the civil war? What do you hope this will do? Uh, so a couple of things. One is Historical events of the past are much more complex than we understand. And many people focus on like specific dates or specific actions like, oh, the Civil War ended when Robert E. Lee surrendered his army at Appomattox on April 9th, 1865. War is mm -hmm. over. Check the box. We're done. Um, and then uh, they move on. And, you know, this transition point of from war to peace is a really important thing to understand because veterans are returning home they're struggling with what to do on both sides and it's just a much more complex system and this is just one small part this is a thousand people out of you know 30 million people uh, but it can be seen as a lens of oh there are a lot of ways that people struggled with this and so just rush facing some of the complexities of how the civil war ends what questions are people at the time facing with Oh, we lost the war. Now, what do we do? And many veterans of the U.S. military had the same thing. You know, they joined the military to fight to preserve the United States or to free and end slavery or they were drafted into the U.S. military and they won the war. Now, what do they do? And so there's this back and forth struggle of, um, you know, what do citizen soldiers or citizen sailors or professional officers do now that the conflict is over and um, just shedding some light so that people can understand that uh, there's a lot more questions, the deeper you dive into the subject, the more complex it gets. And that if you dive deep enough, you can find answers for these things. Uh, they're just going to be kind of varied and all over the place in how, choosing how to interpret that is what we're trying to do. Definitely. I 100% agree because 
history is complicated. There are many different stories, many different avenues to explore. You're never going to get one right answer. You're going to get multiple answers with multiple outcomes. And when we try to think of, you know, the what if that kind of leads into the more fictitious side of history, which is fascinating of itself, but it has to be recognized that it is fictitious, did not happen, but it can be a learning uh, curve or a learning demonstration to show this is how things possibly could have changed and how our history could have changed. And especially with the Civil War, there are so many scholarships, both academic and fictitious, that show how the Civil War could have gone in numerous different avenues. And probably like the last major question I did want to ask you, Neil, is why do you think this discussion of the long Civil War um, doesn't get a lot of recognition in terms of scholarship? Why do you think very few talk about it? And why do you personally feel this discussion is important now uh, in the modern times for modern historians? So the idea that there's a longer so um, it has a, a question of, well, when does the Civil War end and when does Reconstruction begin? And the idea behind the long Civil War is that they're both basically the same thing, just different elements of that conflict over each other. And people are struggling with, well, resistance, you know, the Civil War, resistance to the United States government. And um, part of that is trying to form a country. And then when the Civil War ends and this Confederacy is defeated, there is still resistance to the United States government in different facets. It's just not organized armies in a field. It's, you know, political resistance or it's the Ku Klux Klan emerging or something like that. And so, um, you know, this long Civil War kind of gets divided into the Civil War and Reconstruction. And so um, the idea behind it is just, well, if you zoom out a little bit, you can see how one influences the other. You can see how um, during the Civil War, the Lincoln administration was trying to make reconstruction policies like the 10% plan. Or after the Civil War, during reconstruction, you can see how these veterans are trying to adjust and how does that affect things. Um, and so it's just kind of zooming out and taking a broader picture. Uh, why does it get overlooked a lot? Because people like to classify things into eras or certain time periods and the civil war is easy because there's an end date to it um you know people say the end date is april 1865 when robert e lee surrenders and then you know over the next couple of months other confederate forces surrender to kind of end things um you can kind of classify reconstruction as ending when rutherford hayes takes office but uh it becomes a little less well-defined as like a specific end date or a specific start date for certain things and so uh you know, people like to go, oh, well, that's when this is over. Let's move on to the next thing. And the next thing is tied to this because, I mean, it's also important to remember that military reconstruction is mostly in the southern United States, whereas, um, you know, the Industrial Revolution, the second wave of the Industrial Revolution is starting in the northern states and the frontier right, right. is happening in the western territories at the same time. And so it's not always uh, conducive to say, Oh, well, you know, while this Gilded Age is starting with um, the Rockefellers, that Southerners are still fighting this conflict for control of politics in the Southern states. And so it just kind of gets lost in the picture a little bit. And um, a lot of historians are trying to zoom out that idea to kind of help frame the narrative that, you know, the Civil War affected people a lot more. And in the years after the war, during this reconstruction, people weren't sure what to do. They weren't sure how things were going. And the complexities of that system just get more and more uh, focused as you zoom out and see it all as one bigger conflict, so to speak. Wow. And I think with that great discussion, I think we're going to end it here. Thank you, listeners, for this very, very Great episode. I hope you enjoy it. I want to say a special thank you to our guest, Neil, for joining us and presenting his findings. And I will link all that below in the description of this video. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment below. What was your favorite part about this episode? Was it about the uh, exiles? Was it about the foreign military service? Was it about the lost cause, the beginning of the lost cause? Comment below what was your favorite part of the episode. And again, Neil, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for providing your insight. And thank you again for just being a wonderful guest. Thanks so much. Glad to be here.
Uh, well, on that note, listeners, this has been Tales from the Wandering Scribe, the Historian's Lounge, signing off. Have a good day, everybody.